In the uh, church calendar, we're starting a season that we call Lent, and this is the approach to Good Friday and Easter. And so, as the church goes through its year, we have seasons of Advent, which leads up to Christmas, and then we have Lent, which leads up to Good Friday and Easter. And this is a time when we remember what Christ did for us and how he, he suffered and gave his life for us and then rose again in triumph over the grave. So, as we think about that, we're going to have some sermons that are going to talk about Jesus' words from the cross, the words, that, the words that he said as he was dying. And I want to point out, though, that these are not his last words. You know, sometimes we refer to when we are, if we are going to die, that these are our last words, but for Christ, they were not his last words because he rose again and he lives to this day. So they are not his last words, but they are the words from the cross. Why don't you turn to Luke chapter 23, and I'm going to start reading at verse 28. Luke 23, starting at verse 28. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross, to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. But today we're going to focus on Jesus' words there. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These are Jesus' first words from the cross. He was just crucified, and of all the things that he could have said, this is what he said. Most people, if they're crucified, they would either probably cry out and beg for pity or mercy, Or they would call down vengeance and curses on these enemies that are crucifying them. But Jesus did none of those. Jesus' first words from the cross are, are a prayer. He's talking to God, His Father in heaven. And so Jesus is praying for these people who are crucifying Him. Crucifying Him, the Son of God. One thing that this shows is that Nobody is beyond prayer. Even the people who are crucifying the Son of God are still worth praying for. If there's somebody in your, in your life who you are praying for, somebody who maybe you are worried about or somebody who's going far away from God perhaps, nobody is beyond prayer because even Jesus prayed for the people who nailed Him to the cross. And on that cross, Jesus was physically helpless, but he could still pray. And there's people around us too, people that I visit in nursing homes, for example, people who wonder what what good they are anymore. And one of my favorite responses to them is that prayer is an important part of not only your family, but also the church and God's work in this world. It's by prayer that so much gets done and so much is protected. And so 
Even if you just have a thought in your mind yet, you can pray. So Jesus here, he can't move. He's in terrible pain. And when you're on a cross and you're hanging there like that, it's designed to suffocate you. So you could barely breathe. And he could still pray. He could still pray. And so just a thought for us today is that our physical limitations do not limit our prayers. No matter what physical condition that we are in, even if we are hanging on a cross and can barely breathe, Prayer is still something that we can do, and it's still worthwhile to do. If you think about Jesus on that cross, and how desperate he was for just a breath, how difficult it would be to talk at all, to have those words be a prayer is very significant. He can still pray. And of all the words that he could have said, he decides to pray. Because in prayer we are strong even when we are weak. And when you call upon the Almighty Father in heaven, who knows what is possible? Who knows? Jesus' first words from the cross are prayer, but they are also forgiveness. He could have called... Twelve legions of angels. Legion is something like a thousand. Twelve legions of angels that could have proven that he was the Son of God. Those angels could have come down and taken him from the cross and slaughtered all these awful people who are mocking him and tormenting him. And that would have proved he was the Son of God. Everybody would have believed then. He could have been set free. And he doesn't. He doesn't doesn't stand up for himself here like we might have expected, like everyone else around him expected. If you are the Christ, then save yourself. Why not? The only Son of God had every reason for pride, but he had no pride to defend. He did not defend himself at all. Crucifixion is designed to take every last shred of dignity that you have. You hang naked on that cross so that you would be utterly shamed. And the very last possessions to your name are divided up among those who are crucifying you. So your possessions don't go to loved ones, they go to the people who are killing you. And you are put in the most public place so that everybody can walk by and scoff at you and shake their heads or turn away in horror at you. It's designed to be humiliating. To take away every last shred of pride or dignity that you might have. And this is what Christ endured. And as co-creator of all things, he is worth more than the whole creation Jesus was the one who made all things with the Father. He was there in the beginning with God, and through Him all things were made. John 1 verse 3, all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then Colossians 1, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by Him all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, or thrones, or dominions, or rulers, or authorities, all things are created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is worth more than all of us combined. He is worth more than the whole universe together. He made it all. He had every reason to have some amount of pride on that cross, to stand up for himself a little bit, didn't he? I mean, as the creator of all things, when he came to us, the whole world should have bowed down to him. All of us. We should have bowed down to this man and we should have said, hey, thank you for creating us. Thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for giving us all of these good things that we enjoy in life. 
Thank you for being our God. We owe our existence to him, let alone everything else. And so he had a right to demand every honor and gift the world could possibly offer. He had a right to those things. He wouldn't have been boastful or arrogant or proud to demand everything that we could possibly give him. That would have made sense. It's what he deserves. It's what we owe him. This is a foreign concept to us. This doesn't really make sense in a human mind. We don't really understand not standing up for our rights. I mean, even if you think about the United States, the founding document of our country is about standing up for our rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are inalienable rights for human beings, let alone the Creator. Jesus didn't stand up for any of his rights. None. He didn't stand up for his life, or his liberty, or his pursuit of happiness. In fact, he surrendered them all, voluntarily. He didn't even stand up for his basic human rights. When he was teaching, he never threw out his divine credentials as to kind of trump anybody else. He let his words speak for themselves. When he was in trial, which was really a joke and basically a mock trial, he didn't stand up for himself at all. There was all this injustice going on against him, and he said nothing. There were loads of false accusations that were brought against him, and he didn't answer any of them. He just let them stand. And when he finally was condemned to death, it wasn't for anything that he had done. He was condemned to death for answering honestly who he was. When that chief priest came up to him and says, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said, yes, that's who I am. And then they condemned him to death for answering honestly who he was. Jesus wasn't condemned for anything he did. He was condemned for who he was. Being sinless, he didn't deserve sickness or injury or death. These are all curses that have fallen upon us because we are sinful beings. I mean, when Adam and Eve first sinned in the garden, they were told, okay, because you have sinned, things aren't going to work well anymore. And once you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. He didn't deserve any of this stuff, this sickness and injury and death, because he didn't sin. He didn't deserve, deserve the curses associated with sin. Jesus didn't deserve any of it, but he received all of it. All of it. Isaiah 53 puts it this way, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So he didn't deserve any of it. He received all of it. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was perfectly righteous, but died as the worst sinner. Not just any sinner, the worst. I mean, in the Old Testament, it's written that if you are hung on a tree, then you are cursed by God. Galatians 3.13 even quotes this, Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And then, even in Jesus' own words, just one chapter before what we read, 
Jesus said this, For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. Numbered with the transgressors, the word there is more maybe properly translated lawless. So Jesus, who was the embodiment of the law, who perfectly kept the law, was numbered with the ones who had no law at all. And he was crucified between, it says, two criminals. And they weren't just any criminals either. They were, when you're crucified, you're considered a threat to the state, to national security. You're essentially a terrorist. Jesus was numbered with the terrorists when he had done nothing wrong. And he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's his response to all of this. His words from the cross show that he died for those who crucified him. And this is unprecedented in human history. This never, has never happened really before like this. There's a quote <clears throat> that I have on the screen here that says it really well, I think. He did not die as a martyr for a cause, as others have done, nor was he just nonviolent so the enemy would surrender through public outcry, as still others have done. He came to lay down his life so that, so that the very ones who killed him, who represented all of us, could be forgiven because of the price that he paid in the hell of the world that does not recognize his voice. He died for the ones who crucified him. And he says from the cross those first words that he says, after he was nailed there, his father forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He interceded for them. He's standing up for them. He's defending them. Father, they don't know what they're doing. Please forgive them. Jesus forgave here. He forgave something huge. He forgave the most grievous evil in history. There's nothing worse that has ever happened on this world, in this earth, than the Son of God came to save us and we crucified Him. We crucified the Son of God. There is no more horrendous evil than that. The Creator of us all was crucified by us. We mocked him, we ridiculed him, we spit on him, we beat him, we crucified and killed him, and he was the most holy and honorable son of God. And he came to us. God reached out to us, and we not only rejected him, but slaughtered him. There's nothing worse than that. Jesus forgave it. He forgave the worst evil in history. Let that sink in for a minute. Think about all the terrible things that happen in this world and how awful they are. Jesus forgave the worst one. We just had a school shooting again this week and 17 people lost their lives. And what a horrible tragedy that was. This is worse you look back in history and you see all kinds of genocides, you think of the Holocaust, you think of all these wars and all these atrocities that ever happened, this is worse. This is worse than all of those. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is our Lord and this is our Savior. This is our example. If Jesus can forgive his enemies, and certainly we can too. 
And it doesn't matter if they deserve forgiveness or not, because we surely didn't deserve it. If we can, if he can forgive his enemies, then we can too. Whether they deserve it or not, whether they ask for it or not. These people crucifying Jesus, they didn't ask for forgiveness. They mocked him and they continued to do so. And Jesus forgave them. Jesus tells a story about how much God has forgiven us compared to how much we sin against one another. So he tells a story about there were two servants and one came to the master and he owed 10,000 talents. That's, that's like lifetimes worth of work. Many lifetimes worth of work. And the master forgives this debt. The whole thing. And then this servant goes out and he finds a servant who owes him maybe a hundred bucks. And the guy can't pay him back and so he grabs him and chokes him and he throws him into prison. Lifetime's worth of work versus a hundred bucks. If we can't forgive our enemies, what does that say about our Savior and Lord? Look at the screen here. Let's answer this together. What does the fifth request of the Lord's Prayer mean? Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors means because of Christ's blood. Do not hold against us, poor sinners that we are, any of the sins we do or the evil that constantly clings to us. Forgive us just as we are fully determined as evidence of your grace in us to forgive our neighbors. Even in the Lord's Prayer, it's forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is the way of Christ. And it's even because Jesus forgives us that we can forgive others. It's because we are forgiven that we have now the ability to say, I forgive you now. I don't have a claim to pay you back or to harm you in return. I have a couple examples of this. Some pretty incredible forgiveness a few years ago, there was a shooting at a church in Charleston, South Carolina. There were nine people who were killed. And the shooter was an, an avowed white supremacist. He went into a black church and joined a Bible study there. And he stayed for the entire hour. And he interacted with him and was there for that Bible study. And he opened fire while they bowed their heads in prayer. And he said, I would like to make it crystal clear. I do not regret what I did. I am not sorry. I have not shed a tear for the innocent people I killed. During the sentencing, he insisted that he was not mentally ill and was, at the time of the shootings, fully aware of what he was doing and why. Here's somebody who deserves no forgiveness at all. Here is a despicable person doing an awful thing. And yet, the families of these people, when they spoke at his sentencing, listen to what they say. Here's one woman whose 70-year-old mother was killed. You took something really precious from me. I will never talk to her again. But I forgive you. And have mercy on your soul. You hurt me. You hurt a lot of people. But God forgives you. I forgive you. So this is from somebody who lost his, his wife of many years. I forgive you. And my family forgives you. But we would like you to take this opportunity to repent. Change your ways. And there was one mother who spoke, who survived, 
and had her 26-year-old son gunned down in front of her. And she said this, We welcomed you Wednesday night in our Bible study with open arms. You have killed some of the most beautifulest people that I know, she said in the court. And as we said in the Bible study, we enjoyed you, but may God have mercy on you. There was another woman who lost her husband, and a reporter asks her, the next picture here, that's her. She lost her husband, she had two young kids, and a reporter asked her, this forgiveness, where does this come from? It was not even half a second, she didn't have to think about it at all, she said, God, it's having the Lord in your life. It's because God has forgiven us that we can forgive others, even people like that. I have one more. There's a woman by the name of Rachel Den Hollander. Maybe some of you have heard of her or seen a picture of her. She was the last one to speak at the sentencing of Dr. Larry Nasser, who had abused hundreds. She was abused by him. She was the one who tried to get him to stop and filed the reports so that he could be prosecuted and, and uh, be taken out of his practice. And her whole speech is amazing. I want to encourage you to look her up and read it. She has a perfect balance in there of justice and forgiveness. And I just want to read a little bit of what, of what she said. Larry Nasser brought in a Bible with him one day, and so she talks about that. The Bible that you carried has a final judgment where all of God's wrath and eternal terror is poured out on men like you. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet, because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found, and it will be there for you. I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend it to you as well. You think about what this woman has been through and that, that abuse that she endured. To be able to say, I forgive you. Is amazing. Because Christ forgives us, we can forgive even this sort of thing. The truth of the matter is that it was we ourselves who crucified him. We crucified him. We really can't look at those Jews and those Romans and to say, how dare they? Because it was our sin that put him there. We might as well have mocked him and spit on him and beat him and stretched out his arms on that cross and nailed his hands and his feet to it. We might as well have done that very thing. Because it was our sin that put him there. Isaiah 53. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. And we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We crucified him. That was us. We can't point the finger at anybody else. We did it. It was our sin. And so, if you are a believer, this is a soul-crushing call to repent. When you think about, when we think about the sin that we commit and the sins that linger in our hearts, we should be crushed by that. We crucified the Son of God because of this. It was our fault. 
It's not anybody else's fault, it's ours. We did it. Our soul should be crushed under what we have done with our sin. And we should want to recoil in horror at everything that put him there. It's, it's just awful what we did. We must repent. We are saved by grace, but this is what put him here. We want nothing to do with it. Nothing. And it was not only we ourselves who crucified him, it was we ourselves who he forgave. So when you're reading this story, when you're thinking about Christ on the cross, let's put ourselves in those Romans' shoes with that hammer that nailed him there, looking up at him and say, if you're the Christ, save yourself. Put yourself right there. And then... Put yourself hearing those words. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So we are forgiven. And Jesus Christ himself has pronounced forgiveness on us. And so for believers, this is a soul-freeing resurrection to a new life. We are free. We are free from our sin and we are free to live a new life of love and service to the Lord who forgave us. We should be crushed and we should be freed all at once because of what Jesus has done. As you go into this season of Lent, let's remember what Christ has done for us. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God in heaven, it's amazing that you would forgive people like us, people who crucified your only son and treated him horribly. So Lord, help us to have that sink in because Lord, we believe in you. And so Lord, we we believe that it was our sin that put you there. And Lord, it was our sin that you also forgave. Lord, help us to sink that in to our minds and to our hearts so that, Lord, we would repent and that we would live with joy in this newness of life that you give to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.